Hello and welcome to Forgotten Fronts. In today's episode, we'll be playing the scenario, La Haison. But first, the history. If you don't want to hear the history, a time shall come up on your screen. Wait for it. Now! With the attack of Dolan's Corps at 145, Charlotte's 1st Brigade of Kiot's Division, consisting of 2,000 men in four battalions of the 54th and 55th Line Infantry, Charlotte's Brigade's orders was to move to take the farmhouse of La Haison. The farmhouse of La Haison was much smaller than Hougamau. The name roughly translates into Holy Hedge. The farmhouse was garrisoned by the 2nd Light Company of the King's German Legion of Om Patel's Brigade. I'm going to put the name on the screen. The battalions were led by Major Baring and Major Boswell. The King's German Legion were exiles from Napoleon invasion. Fueled by vengeance, they were some of Wellington's best troops. Due to King George being the King of Hanover, the King's German Legion were considered British troops, and so they were equipped likewise. For the Light Company, this meant they were equipped with green uniforms and Baker rifles, much like the 95th rifles. Due to their fierce reputation that they earned in the Peninsula Wars, as well as their equipment, they were nicknamed by the French Le Colhunt Vert, roughly translating into the Green Rascals. However, Wellington only deployed 450 King's German Legion into the farmhouse. Mark Adkins, in his book The Waterloo Companion, suggests that Wellington underestimated its importance. Despite it being an excellent springboard for the French attack, and an excellent bulwark for the defense of the center of the ridge, as any French units moving to attack the ridge would face flanking fire, and thus would be forced to narrow their front. Another example of the misunderstanding of the importance of the farm was that few defensive preparations were made in La Haison, as Baring's pioneers and tools were sent to put out defenses in Hougamont. This only worsened by the lack of timber, as many of the flammable items, including the barn doors, were removed for firewood in the early morning hours. As a result, few crude loopholes were cut into the high stone wall, and only a rough firing step was put up in a few locations, causing the act to shoot over or through the walls to be restrictive or impossible. However, the barn entrance was heavily barricaded with farm implements, and a heavy barricade was put on the chasse, made with other farming implements and timber. However, the main weakness of their defenses was that no reserve of ammunition was prepared before the battle. When deploying his men, Baring put a company in the orchard and two in the farm, with one in the rear farm as a reserve. Around one o'clock, French skirmishers attacked and were pushed back by the King's German Legion and the 95th Rifles in the nearby sand pit. The first attack was renewed when Shaw's brigade moved in in column, capturing the orchard around 1.30, pushing the King's German Legion into the west side of the farm. However, with no way to scale the wall and no way to force the gate, the attack was stopped. In this attack, the second in command, Major Boswell, was killed. Seeing the fight wasn't going well, von Alten or the Duke sent in the Lundberg Light Company, as well as two companies of Kielman King's German Legion of roughly 647 men to counterattack under von Klenk, Mausalk, and von Glieser. I wonder if there's any relation with the 11th Corps commander at Gettysburg. As the reinforcements descended the ridge, Major Baring and a few rushed out to meet them, but unbeknownst to them, Charlotte's flank was being supported by Dubois Carassier. The light troops could not see the 100 armed horsemen as they were hidden by uneven ground. The Carassier then charged them. The light scattered toward the barn and ridge. Many were cut down, among them von Klenk. Light troops lost their colors. Few reached the farm, but among them Major Baring, just in time too as the French surged forth in another attack on the east and west flank of the farm. But after heavy fighting, Charlotte's brigade is pushed back once again, and the King's German Legion retake the garden. The King's German Legion reportedly repelled Charlotte's brigade the majority of the way back to La Belle Alliance, after which a half-hour lull incurred around La Haison, in which two light companies of the 2nd King's German Legion were moved forward, as well as one line company of the 5th King's German Legion, equipped similarly to the British Line Infantry. These new reinforcements doubled the garrison to 800 men. All the while, as reinforcements came in, Baring and the King's German Legion shored up the defenses, as well as making new ones, making loopholes where cannons damaged the walls. However, despite sending requests, no more ammunition was sent to the farmhouse. Major Baring wrote, What must have been my feelings, when one counting the cartridges, I found that on average, there was not more than three to four each, and then the French formed up to make a second attack, commencing at three. Sir, a French cars here, yeah, supporting the wall. Tells the men to hold their fire. You must be a deserter. At this rate, Napoleon's army will have nobody left in it, huh? What do you want? Do you surrender? We will shelter you. <laughs> Vive l'Empereur! <laughs> Cheeky bastard! Men, open fire! As we open the scenario, I'm contemplating how to take the farmhouse. I quickly decided to use a strategy that I used in the attack of Jalan's Corps, moving the forces of Charlotte's column into double line formation to attack the farmhouse with two battalions at a time. All the while in the distance, we can hear the thundering hooves of an approaching courier with our orders. 
Just after Charlotte yells his orders to form double line to the awaiting battalions of his brigade, the courier approaches, struggling to reach the commander to, to deliver his destiny in the Sea of Men. As the courier finally reaches the commander, both men know what the letter contains before the commander breaks the seal as to what the orders contain. The orders state that the commander must make another bloody assault on the farmhouse to his front, garrisoned by the elite forces of the King's German Legion. Surveying the ground by the farmhouse with his telescope, all seemed clear. However, Charlotte knew he was fooling himself as the first assault and the loss of many of his brigade made obvious. Despite this, his orders were clear and so moved his men to return to the hedge they recently had lost, again into the accurate fire of the Green Rascals, this time only ordering two of his battalions forward to the padded charge while the other two observed their glorious advance in reserve, lying down to avoid the angry cannonballs screaming over their heads. As the brigade advances towards the farmhouse, Napoleon's beautiful daughters continue their bombardment of the Allies on the ridge, punishing them for slaughtering the men of Delon's First Corps at the point of the saber and hooves. However, this was far from Charlotte's mind, as instead he focused on the task ahead, as he knew his first obstacle he would face would be the German terrier in the orchard in the front of the farmhouse. This worry was not shared by the men of Charlotte's brigade, as they yearned for a chance to revenge their fallen comrades in the first assault, or better yet, honor their memory and make France and the Emperor proud of their regiments by taking the farmhouse itself. As the regiments drew near, the batteries of cannon became more and more deafening, as well as the rage of their lost comrades. Their ears rang like the constant tattoo of drumbeats that followed them into the contest, sulfur from the guns drifting over, blinding them and blackening their faces as they continued to march forward, some saying silent prayers, wishing that for their success and their preservation, as they knew what awaited them in the orchard. Though knowing this, they still pushed forward with grim determination, as thoughts of bravado are quickly replaced by worry that typically follows a soldier as he goes into combat. The battalions finally reach their attack jumping off point, and they look to the hedges, and they can see for a brief moment the German terriers that await them, before they scatter themselves in the trees once again. But not having a long time to think about this, the two battalions are ordered forth by Charlotte into the hedges that surround the orchard, the commander yelling rallying cries to his men as they begin their war cry of Vive l'Empereur, as rhythmically as the steps they take towards the orchard, bayonets leveled towards their hidden foe. The sight of their advance would be the most glorious sight to behold if they were on the parade grounds of Paris, but here it looked quite poor as mud slowed the men, causing men to stumble, separating the columns, their uniforms spattered with blood and mud from the previous attack. They were not but a hundred meters away from the hedges as they heard a whistle blow and they saw puffs of smoke erupt from the trees followed by screams of the men of the first ranks. The already torn standards of their regiments became even more damaged as rifle shots pierced them. This was followed shortly by the command to advance the double quick to the hedges, the bodies of the recently fell being trampled under their feet as they advanced, as a hail of shot erupted from the orchard by the hidden skirmishers. As the men finally reached the hedges, they must stop themselves from wanting to return fire before the order is given, as the skirmishers fell on board the unfortunate men from their ranks. The French immediately yeah. attacked all over the heights with two close columns. Both marched through the sets of masses to the orchard, so the for a fire. With the precision of the drill score, the men await their orders as they prepare to fire as shot whistles around them. The battalions closed rank as they prepared to unleash two great volleys into the orchard, the drummers furiously beating out the orders as the men prepared themselves to fire, going through the motions as if second nature, loading and priming their pads as they present their pieces to open a great volley into the enemy, presenting their pieces over the shoulder of the man in the first rank, filling in the gaps where their file partner were slain. The first volley was fired by the 1st Battalion of the 54th, then by the 1st Battalion of the 55th. Death crashed into the rank of the left, then the right of the German terrier with the crackle of 400 muskets. The screams of the dead and dying filled the air as the two sides continued to exchange fire. The French line battalions insisted upon firing volleys while the German skirmishers continued to fire at will. The German skirmishers taking cover in the trees, avoiding the majority of the French volleys, pick apart the French battalion's command structures and take aim at the higher ranks. The French battalions continue to take heavy casualties in the firefight as accurate fire pours forth from the orchard. Charlotte, standing in between the two battalions, encourages his men to continue fighting, as they still have to go through the bloody process of storming the farmhouse itself. As if it were even possible, things worsen as Allied artillery begins to smash through the ranks of the 1st Battalion of the 54th Line. Men scream in agony as cannonballs roll through their ranks, blowing off limbs. All the while, the two sides continue to exchange fire as smoke obscures the two sides, men's eyes sting and choke from the haze as the pieces of the cartridges smolder in the muddy ground around them. The chaos and the smoke, punctuated by the screams, make the experience like traveling to the depths of hell itself. 
All the while, the French battalions continue to focus on the firefight with the skirmishers in the orchard. A battalion of the King's German Legion line infantry marches forward around the skirmishers to support their flank. As they advance, they too are raked by cannon fires. Cannonballs smash down their files. When they arrive, they begin to trade volleys with the 1st Battalion of the 54th Line, forming up in the cover of the hedges. Seeing that the men are becoming too unordered, Charlotte orders his battalions to fire another volley into the orchard, and so against their instinct to defend themselves, the men stop firing and begin to reload. All the while, the skirmishers continue to kill off men around them with accurate fire from their Baker rifles. The men load in unison as a hail of lead continues to whiz around them. Seeing their comrades in danger, the two battalions in the rear got up from the ground. One wanted to split off skirmishers to support their other battalion. However, Charles sends a courier back and tells the men to get back to cover and wait for his orders. So the men of the two battalions reluctantly take cover once again. All of all, Charles is continuing to order his battalions to fire volleys to break the skirmishers faster. As the fire pit continues, the men take major casualties from the accurate fire of the Germans' Baker rifles, and the only defense the battalion has was being slightly hidden by the smoke and hedges bordering the orchard. Two more volleys crash into the King's German Legion, yet they still hold their ground, and Charlotte orders the battalions to fire two more, hoping that they're near breaking. The French battalion uniforms are stained with blood and powder burns as they carry on the fight, as bullets cut through the air, one hitting the Imperial Eagle, denting it, nearly tearing it from the arms of the surprise bearer. As the firefight continued, Charlotte's officer tried to convince him to advance into the orchard, but he hesitated, and there was an argument between them, as the firefight continued, as casualties continued to mount. During this argument, the bugler sounded the advance, and hearing the bugle call to advance, the glory hound that led the 2nd Battalion of the 55th Line formed a column and began to advance towards the Haisson. Noticing the column advancing, Charlotte summons a courier and sends it to the battalion, and orders them to move to the flank of the guard to hit the skirmishes in the flank. Hoping then he would get his breakthrough to attack the farm. All the while, the fighting continues around the orchard, and NCOs were forced to lead a battalion as officers were quickly all killed. Rifle shots piercing through a man, hitting another, only helping to increase the devastating casualties of the two battalions. The French diners become entitled remains of their former glory in the hailstorm of lead. The bodies of the men began to pile up on each other and get caught in the hedges. One of the most heartrending moments happened around this time in the orchard, where the body of a dead drummer boy lay dying in the field, bleeding out. Another soldier rushing to him, being the former orphanage owner that used to take care of him. The heat around the orchard began to rise as the bushes around the orchard caught fire, and the men on both sides using the precious water of their half-depleted canteens to put out the fire, before the farmhouse caught a blaze. By this point in the firefight, the men were unrecognizable, wild-eyed with their uniforms and faces covered in blood, dirt, and gunpowder stains. <laughs> No more than four, rushing into the orchard, intensifying the contest with the Germans, rushing from tree to tree, advancing to the farmhouse. 
Then the beagle is called for the battalions to advance in skirmish formation into the orchard, finding a chance for the men to attack the Germans effectively, and so the men fix bayonets and rush into the trees, beginning a deadly cat and mouse game with the skirmishers. The first to go was the 1st Battalion of the 54th Line, rushing into the right flank of the skirmishers in two moves. As artillery continued to plow down their ranks, made worse by the trees that shattered, causing huge deadly splinters to fly everywhere on contact. Then came the 1st Battalion of the 55th, who after facing the two battalions suffered heavy casualties, particularly those of the companies who fought in the leftmost flank of the battalion. Their last officer was bleeding out, yelled, Pour l'Empereur, before being hit by another ball which killed him. Moving forward, the battalions gave the stretcher bearers access to the non-walking wounded of the battalions, though many of them had been smothered by the other corpses that fell on top of them. However, those they managed to rescue were immediately hauled off for surgery. As the 2nd Battalion of the 55th advance is seeing the removal of the corpses, the conscripts vomited, seeing the state of some of them, only worsening the nervousness of first combat. The 1st Battalion of the 55th in the meantime began to advance closer up on the flank of the German skirmishers. the 1st Battalion of the 54th saw the bloody remains of the German skirmish battalion in the orchard. As they advanced, they saw many of the men of the companies on both flanks had been killed, and only made it worse when they opened another crashing volley at close range of the skirmishers, suddenly announcing their presence with a crackle of musketry, felling many of the skirmishers in the left flank of their formation. The balls smacked off trees, barked flying through the air, cutting the skin of those fortunate enough to avoid the bullets. Shells exploded overhead, raining a hard travel through the branches, wreaking havoc amongst the unsuspecting troops below. The 2nd Battalion, the 55th, fared far worse as they were out in the open by the garden, under the full weight of the Allied artillery on the ridge, shells blasting large holes in their ranks, but to the officer's credit, he managed to keep the Manga Battalion in cohesion while awaiting orders under heavy fire. But finally a brave carrier arrived, braving a hail of shot and rain of shells to arrive to the battalion of men to order them to the hedges that surround the orchard. The others continued to advance and surround the head of their skirmishers in the orchard. The orchard fired volleys into the German flank as the 55th battalion nearby advanced within 80 yards, but suddenly the battalion of skirmishers turned and the men swept towards them, and the men panicked. Suddenly, a great mass of German troops came right for us. Many of the men fled. The officer attempted to stop those who did, even shooting one with his pistol. Due to the gloom, the hanging powder smoke, the advancing troops looked like men charging, and so the battalion panicked and withdrew, leaving the other battalion in the garden to face the skirmishers alone, making it necessary for the troops to take cover by the trees. The German skirmishers rushed to different trees, bringing about their full fire to bear on the remaining battalion. Around this time, the 2nd Battalion of the 55th arrived in the bushes on the east side of the farmhouse, forming into a line to fire upon the skirmishers in the orchard. Seeing the dire situation that the 1st Battalion of the 55th was in, Charlotte moved in to rally them. As he approached them, he was forced to dismount due to the low smoke being caught in the trees. Around this time, the threats of the officer with the 54th Battalion was able to convince the men to rally quickly. But Charlotte sent a courier to them and ordered them to their rear, and another to bring up the final reserve battalion to the farm.
The skirmishers in the orchard finally break, leaving the King's German Legion line battalion to hold the hedgerow on its own, all the while the French battalions continue to advance. The two French battalions advance in the double on the flank of the German line infantry. Charlotte rams those two final battalions remaining in the orchard, making sure to keep control of them as they advance to the farm. while the shattered remains of the 54th Battalion in the rear took cover as the fresh battalion of the 55th advanced to the orchard. The combined fire of the two battalions easily broke the small battalion of line infantry, and there was a short lull as the French planned to proceed to capture the rest of the farmhouse. Remarkably, the small battalion managed to reform, so Charlotte moved the two battalions to the edge of the orchard to repel the two final battalions from the area. But one of the Hanoverian battalions is hidden from the rest of the French battalions in the orchard around the side of the farmhouse. The two French battalions prepared to repel the small battalion of the King's German Legion. They activated a far larger Legion battalion which was hidden behind the farmhouse. As the battalion advanced around to the other side of the farmhouse to the orchard, Charlotte, however, seeing the fresh line battalion of the King's German Legion begin to move around to support their fellow battalion's flank, moved his battalions angling away from the corner of the farmhouse. All the while, Charlotte and the staff moved to take the farmhouse itself, barricading the gates and doors so the Legion could recapture it. As Charlotte and his staff set up defenses, the battalion of infantry went around the corner and was blasted by the waiting battalions. As we were trading fire with a small German ah! another battalion came from behind the farmhouse, straight into our beds and received a hail of fire. As the column got closer, the battalion was showered by musket balls as they slowly approached, trampling the wounded in their wake. Following shortly behind them was Major Baron, urging his troops forward by saying things like the eyes of Hanover were all upon you, before rushing over to another battalion to rally them with similar words. Rounding the corner, the battalion formed into line, threatening to engage in melee. Seeing this, our battalion fell back, and not to give up an opportunity, the Legion charged. Our battalion withdrew. Responding to this, a nearby battalion lost cohesion but managed to regroup, turning to face the new battalion as the French battalion continued to rush forward. It is time to show the Germans how true soldiers fight. The other battalion faced us on this day, but we shall not follow their example. The battalion will advance! Advance! The fresh battalion rushed forward to support a small battalion as the legion continued to advance. The small battalion delayed the legion as long as they could as the large battalion gets into position. But the King's German Legion approached too close and the small battalion attempted to escape, but a few companies from the legion rushed forward and they were drawn into a melee.
The men of the small battalion were soon overwhelmed and forced to surrender, leaving one French battalion alone in the orchard. They were cut off from their line of communication, with Charlotte trapped in the barricaded farmhouse, with the King's German Legion all around. The commander ordered our men forward. As he did so, he looked over in horror to the other battalion, which had been charred by the Hanoverians, and the men had surrendered in droves. He froze up, telling us to kill them all and to leave no survivors. The men of the 1st Battalion of the 55th were too ashamed to look at the remains of their 2nd Battalion as they laid down their arms and were taken to the rear. The 1st Battalion was ordered to wheel to face the large battalion which now threatened their flank, but as they did so, the battalion formed into line once again, and the large German battalion charged them. Seeing this, the officer of the battalion ordered the battalion to fall back. However, the Germans, seeing this, wanted to press their advantage and charged the withdrawing battalion, who, after a brief attempt to countercharge, broke into a retreat, so the orchard was recaptured by the King's German Legion once again. In the meantime, the bloody battalion of the 55th moved into the hedges and fired upon the large battalion who was firing upon the retreating battalion with no mercy. Despite this, the large French battalions managed to reform and counterattacked into the orchard, doing so with anger unmatched. All the while, the stranded Charlotte and staff observed this from the makeshift firing step of the farmhouse, scanning the horizon for the battalion that retreated earlier with their telescopes, but they were nowhere to be found, doing all this while Charlotte was perilously all around them. As they informed, one of the battalions managed to relieve Charlotte and his staff from the farmhouse by moving to the eastern side of it. In the meantime, the King's German Legion, hoping to push the French from the orchard once and for all, forming line once again to exchange shot with the French battalion. However, they were not as well equipped for this as their red uniforms stood out in the orchard, causing many more casualties. However, in the haze, Major de Baring was lost and wandered towards the French line and was nearly captured by the men of the 1st Battalion of the 54th Line, but as they rushed forward, he managed to escape. Hearing the order to advance, the two battalions began to aggressively move forward to push back the Hanoverians out of the orchard. At the same time, the battalion rushing forward to save the general staff moved up at the double to hit the Hanoverians' flank. Keep moving, men! Ah! Then drive the Bosch out of the orchard, and the day will be ours! Ah! The commander of my group yelled, and suddenly I realized the source of his confidence as another battalion approached the Legion's flank. The battalion advanced as groups of men behind the trees leapfrogged each other as the battalion advancing at the double moved into the hedges on the Germans' flank. Moving at the double the entire way, crossing the Brussels road and moving into the hedges, they form into a line in the bushes just on the side of the Legion line of tree, preparing a volley, aiming low to make sure their musket balls hit home. They also do this in an effort not to harm the Major, who is more valuable alive than dead. Eventually, they unleash a hail of fire that kills half the leftmost company of Legion troops. Despite their efforts, one of the balls manages to hit the head of the major, putting a hole through it. Before the battalion rushes from the hedges into the orchard, making straight for the broken up formation of the legion, causing them huge casualties as men try to get to safe spots in the trees. All the while, the line in the hedgerow falters, but regroups. The men don't have time. They must break the legion. As the battalion unleashes a withering fire on the flank of the legion line, another skirmish battalion is spotted by Charlotte, sending a courier to warn the battalions that are in contest in the orchard to prepare themselves. However, by this time, the line battalion of the King's German Legion is badly bloodied. They have lost almost half their men. 
They lose cohesion and begin to withdraw despite the rallying cries of bearing just behind them that reinforcements are on the way. The firefight continues for some moments, but seeing the risk of being outflanked, the fresh battalion charges the flank of the Hanoverians for revenge of their loss. After a quick but vicious melee, they manage to push them out of the orchard, recapturing it. In the confusion of men running from the French battalion, Major Baron was caught in the mud and was attacked by three French line infantrymen who pulled him from his horse. At that moment, despite my best attempt to rally them, the battalion in the orchard broke, and this time the French overtook me. Once again, chasing the last of the King's German Legion from the orchard, the second battalion of the 55th line reforms and moves to the western edge, prepared for the assault in the orchard. However, now before sending a company of men to escort the wounded and dirty Major Baring to the rear. While the first battalion of the 55th moved to face this new threat, the first battalion of the 54th moved to the center of the orchard to support either large battalion. As the battalion continued to move into position, artillery continues to rain down, hitting the trees, launching deadly splinters in all directions. The farmhouse provided little cover as a hot shrapnel set the roof alight. More couriers moved down from the western gate to order the first battalion of the 54th to continue their assault to the rear garden, but a shell exploded among them, rendering an officer to the same consistency of ground meat, and the battalion shattered. The remains of the regimental eagle lay on the ground in splinters. Around this time, the first battalion of the 55th escaped the bloody remains of the orchard, encountering the German skirmishers in the open ground. Sherlock quickly recalls the 2nd Battalion of the 55th to the eastern hedges to receive the German skirmishers, catching them in the crossfire. The German skirmishers were caught in the heavy barricade on the Brussels Road. Many did not risk climbing over it to expose themselves to sudden death. After many threats from their commander to advance was not heeded, they eventually took cover behind the barricade, but a 2nd Battalion of the French approached in their flank, quickly convinced them to retire to the rear. However, in the meantime, the two German battalions that were previously broken had reformed and were approaching the orchard once again. Not wanting to lose the orchard for a third time, Charlotte ordered his battalions to support the flanks of the farmhouse. Hopefully, moving them forward would also chase off the retreating battalions of Hanoverians that remain. Charlotte was ready to make this order as the Hanoverian battalions quickly reformed by the farmhouse, threatening to break in by hitting the barricaded gates with their rifle butts. The first battalion of the 55th rushed up to the barricade, taking cover behind it. But the German skirmishers advanced boldly, disregarding the heavy fire they were taking. This bravery intimidated the French battalion, who quickly withdrew and then broke. On the eastern side of the farmhouse, things were not much better as the two columns advanced towards each other. However, the French battalion commander, not wanting to engage in melee, withdrew and formed the men into line. As the Germans continued to march in column, the Grand Battery blasted them a shot and the men opened a hail of musketry towards them. However, despite the heavy fire, the men continued forward.
The call got closer to the battalion lead position and poured more fire onto their flank. The commander followed him, reaching the gates of the farmhouse to investigate to find out why his orders were being countered so effectively, and a fight ensued in the courtyard with the sabers of the two general staff. But the staff and the new leader of the King's German Legion were quickly repelled, withdrawing out of the east gate. Around this time, the battalion regrouped and took up positions along the hedges that surround the orchard to counter the skirmishers. The eastern advance of the King's German Legion threatened the flank of the two battalions, and so the 1st Battalion of the 54th was deployed into the eastern side of the orchard. All the while, the 2nd Battalion of the 55th blasted the flank of the King's German Legion with musketry as they continued to advance into the orchard. Seeing this, the new commander of the King's German Legion Brigade struggled over to them in the muddy orchard to rally them. Those supporting were the larger battalions of the 55th. During the firefight with the skirmishers, the 1st Battalion of the 54th was routed, sustaining heavy casualties. But to the east of the farmhouse, the fire became too much for the battalion of the King's German Legion advancing in column, and they broke. The French battalion nearby, seeing this, charged, capturing as many as they can, including the new commander. The nearby battalion of King's German Legion, seeing the capture of their commander, surrendered. However, seeing the casualties, Charles Brigade took in the attack. Along with the loss of Jalan's corps, the attack was ordered to withdraw. It is a major defeat, even though we've broken the King's German Legion Brigade and can easily capture the victory points now, we've run out of time. Now we must go over the casualties. Adventures in time! Hey, Stefan, did you use the one about Napoleon and the rabbits? Ah, no one is these again, your story. You need some more stories. Ah, shut off, my stories are fine, you old fool. Quite in the ranks. Well, go on then, anything to get my mind off my sore feet. In fact, the story goes that after Napoleon beat the Russians and Austrians at Austrians, he wanted to celebrate the end of the war with a rabbit hunt, and so ordered his officers to order his brigade to capture a thousand rabbits. Well, what was he going to do with them? Well, what was he going to do with them? Well, if you would shut up, I would tell you. Now, where was I? Ah, yes, he sent us the division to get the rabbits. Later that day, they returned with cages full of rabbits. And so the ogre and his marshals got ready for the hunt. Went with his marshals and a few attendants to a local forest to set them free. In order to give them a fighting chance, they let them out a bit early. And upon setting them free, the rabbits looked around in new wonderment of their surrounding. Before they turned around and ba started batting right for Napoleon and his followers. Napoleon, after being confounded for a few moments in the most amusing scene you could probably imagine, began to become concerned and took out a whip to attempt to scare them away. However, the thousands of rabbits continued moving forward and threatened to overwhelm Napoleon and his marshals. And so they started distributing the spears to him, his marshals and the nearby attendants. However, the rabbits soon overtook them and began to climb up Napoleon's arms and legs, forcing him to flee to his nearby carriage. Why did they do that? When Napoleon's supply officer, being the lazy bastard that he is, decided to go to the local villages and to get a bunch of tame rabbits instead of wild rabbits like Napoleon requested, and the tame rabbits mistook Napoleon for the man who fed them. 